Okay, let's get started. Um, let's talk about let's talk about scheduling. We really need to, to figure some stuff out. Um, so this is what I've proposed. All right, everybody. All right, all right so this is what I've proposed for the schedule. Um, uh, in order to make sure that I'm not throwing too much stuff on the final, um, I was I was considering all right, all right, all right. Um, I was considering having uh, exam two be just sheer and still doing it on the fifth, but I, I've decided to move it back a little bit because if I do that, then the final is going to have columns, beam columns, uh, 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 development length, and serviceability all on one exam, and I think that's going to be a lot. So um, what I've decided to do is this. I'm going to move the exam to Wednesday the 12th. So I'm moving it back one week, okay? So I want everybody to be aware of what the schedule is going to be like. So everybody wants to pay attention to this. So I'm going to assign homework 7 on Monday, which is going to be on deflections, on serviceability. Uh, it'll be assigned on Monday, April 3rd. You all will turn it in. Monday, April 10th. I will give you the solution on Monday, April 10th. We will have exam, uh, exam two review on the 10th, the exam on Wednesday the 12th. Okay? Does that sound reasonable? Uh, uh, unless I'm mistaken, we shouldn't have any major homeworks due in uh, steel, and if so, I might move those to that Friday. Because um, that's no big deal. Because we're actually making some pretty good progress in steel, and we should have plenty of time to for the rest of the semester to discuss beams in steel. Because we only have maybe two more days with columns, maybe three. So, um, and the third day is going to be we have a really long design example coming up. Um, so yeah, uh, anybody have any questions on that? Everybody okay with that? All right. Um, Class canceled on Friday. We are heading to ODU tomorrow, so I won't be here. Um, so no class on Friday, and that, that's it. So everybody good? All right, so we're going to be talking about serviceability. We're going to be continuing uh, our uh, analysis example because we're going to add long-term deflections to it. Let me sort of go back and, and, and just sort of make sure everybody is refreshed on what's going on with this, okay? So if you recall, the, the last thing that we just did was we discussed uh, immediate deflections, which was uh, essentially looking at um, if I apply load, what's the deflection right now, okay? And, and that's, once you got effective moments of inertia down, that's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, however, um, over time, as we know, concrete properties change. Um, changes in humidity and moisture content, uh, concrete tends to creep, there's shrinkage that goes along, uh, et cetera. So that, um, that, can, that can definitely uh, uh, change concrete properties over time. So um, we need to be able to modify um, deflections over the long term. It's also a function of how much of that load is sustained, and it just depends on the building working on. Loads in a storage warehouse might uh, be, uh, you might have a different level of sustained load than let's say uh, sustained loads in an office building. That just boils down to, uh, to judgment. Again, we talked about this last time. Um, <coughs> the general form of the modifier that we use is we take our uh, immediate deflections uh, of whatever we're looking at and we multiply it by the following quantity in parentheses. It's a function of however much reinforcement we have uh, for compression steel, uh, AS prime over BD, and then our time dependent factor, which our time dependent factor is just, you know, as time increases, the, uh, uh, the, the long-term deflections also increase. <coughs> so anything that's less than three, or anything three months, you know, time dependent factor is one. If it's uh, load sustained for six months, we'll say it's about 1.2. 12 months, we'll say it's about 1.4. Uh, anything five years or more, we'll say is a uh, 2.0. So um, we ultimately, to compute the total amount of deflection, we're going to need dead loads, live loads, and then sustained live loads. But remember, we cannot compute live load deflection by itself. We have to compute dead load deflection, and then dead plus live load deflection, and then take the difference. 
The same thing with sustained loads. We can't calculate sustained live load deflection by itself. We have to calculate dead load deflection and dead load plus sustained live load deflection and, and take the difference. Sound good? All right. <coughs> so total deflection altogether, absolutely, absolute total deflection is uh, our immediate live load deflection, uh, dead load deflection adjusted for long-term effects, and then sustained live load deflection adjusted for time effects. Um, we use an infinite duration factor for, uh, for dead loads because dead loads don't go anywhere. They're always there. Live loads are the only ones that, that are transient, so our duration may change. So, sound good? Yes. Because uh, here, this is, uh, keep in mind, this, this time-dependent factor, it's, it's an empirical curve. It comes from testing and, 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 and analytics. What I'm saying is that curve basically asymptotes at 2, is all I'm saying. Sound good? All right. Um, where was I? I was here. Okay. So these deflections are great, um, but we need to compare uh, those uh, deflections against uh, specified limits. So, uh, for instance, if we have uh, flat roofs uh, or floors not supporting or attached uh, to, uh, to non-structural elements, then we just take our immediate live load deflection and compare it against the, uh, the following uh, uh, elements. But if we have roof or floor construction that is attached to non-structural elements that are likely to be damaged by deflections, then we've got to use that, uh, that total deflection that you see, uh, that you see right here. A lot of these deflection limits come from, again, it has nothing to do with, uh, with safety considerations. Uh, for instance, the deflection, some of these deflection limits, like for instance L over 360, one of the main reasons that deflection limits like this came into play um, is the result of using different types of construction. Like, like for instance, how many of you all have ever been in a house or an apartment that had plastered roofs? Have you all ever seen plastic roofs? Okay. Well, what happens is if the floor or the roof system deflects too much, the plaster cracks. It has nothing to do with whether or not the, the system's going to fall down. You know, it's all about day-to-day -day use of the structure. You don't want the plaster to crack, right? So the beams have to be stout enough to prevent that from happening. That's what we're talking about with these deflection limits. Again, it's not safety, okay, which is why we don't apply load factors, okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, water pool, uh, and you can have um, a, a phenomenon called ponding, which is something we really, really like to avoid in structural engineering. Have I described ponding to you all before? Yeah. The idea that if you collect water, you get deflection, which allows for more water, which allows for more deflection, it sort of builds on itself. So, yeah, ponding something you try and avoid. That's yeah, yeah, and, and that's another thing, like, because, uh, you know, roofs, are not really usually designed to carry people all the time, whereas floor systems are. So we are more stringent on our floor system deflections than we would be for roof system deflections. Does, does that make sense? I mean, but again, yeah. As long, but, but I'll say, as long as we have adequate drainage, we shouldn't really have a problem on the water end. Assuming. Sound good? Okay. So I want to look, so this is what I want to do. We, we did example 15A. Let me go back to 15A so everybody remembers this. So here was our beam. Okay, um, We had a simply supported beam that had one kip per foot of dead load. We had 0.7 kips per foot live load. Now let's remember what we computed, okay? Because we did a lot with this example. We have our gross moment of inertia. We have our cracked moment of inertia, right? We also have our cracking moment. Okay, and then using those quantities, we computed a dead load deflection, a dead plus live load deflection, and then we had a live load deflection, which we took as the difference of those two, right? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to take this beam and I want to do a little more with it, okay? I want to say, let me go forward a little bit. Okay, so let's take a look at that beam. Let's determine if that beam meets deflection requirements for immediate deflection and for long-term deflections. So we're going to consider that this is a floor beam uh, attached to elements likely to be damaged, and in addition, consider 
of the live load to be sustained over a period of three years. Everybody good? So I'm giving you the amount of, of load that is sustained. If you don't know and you're not sure and you want to make a conservative estimate, just assume it all is, you know. That probably isn't likely under certain scenarios. I don't think that the, the design live load for a classroom is sustained 100% of the time over five years. In 45 minutes, we're all leaving, right? So, you know, uh, just something to think about. Okay, sound good? All right, Cup, a couple things. Um, let's see. Uh, looking at our beam, what is rho prime? And what is that for this beam? Say it again? It's not undefined, it's zero, right? There is no compression steel, right? So here's our beam, right? No rebar up top, right? So when we do our, uh, our, our deflection calcs and we take our row prime, our row prime is going to be zero. Make sense? Because it's AS prime over BD and there's no AS prime. Sound good? Okay, now let's go back to that example once this decides to load up and All right, so let, let's recall some parameters. You all help me out with this. Oh, goodness. When this thing first wakes up, it's a little tricky to work with. 15B. Okay, so we're taking the stuff that we did in 15A and we're moving along. So let, let's recall from 15A a few things. because we're going to have to do a few more deflection calcs, okay? So, let's see. Let's start off with the loads, okay? So what was the dead load, what was the live load, and what was the length? So what was the dead load? There we go. What was the live load? What was the length? Okay, now let's look at some beam properties. Okay, so what was E sub C? KSI, right? All right, uh, the gross moment of inertia and the cracked moment of inertia. And okay, and a cracking moment. All right, sound good? All right, and lastly, Let's go ahead and do this, okay? So what was our dead load deflection, our dead plus live load deflection, and our live load deflection? So dead load. Making you all do some work. Zero point two four five inches. Sound good? And somebody else. All right. So that made this zero point two two two. Sound good? Okay. Now 
Let me show you a more, maybe a more streamlined or efficient way of doing this. Um, if you recall, I mentioned last time that this is a calculation that's very Excel friendly. Y'all remember that? Okay. So I'm gonna let, let's look at some deflection calcs and. Let's, uh, let's sort of streamline it a little bit. I'll show you a different way of doing this. So case. So there's actually only going to be three different deflections that we actually compute using structural analysis. We're going to have um, dead load, dead load plus live load, and then we're going to have dead load plus how much live load? 30%. So 30% of L. So we'll call that D plus SL. Now, some of these calculations we have already done. So, you know, sort of bear with me on that. So first off, W sub A. This is going to be in kips per foot. So Let's see if you all remember this. So the first thing that we did when we computed deflections is we determined the load. And remember, our applied load under dead load was one kip per foot, and here it was 1.7. Do you all remember that? Okay, so what is our applied load going to be in this instance? 1.21. So you got that by taking one plus 30% of 0.7, right? Is everybody okay with that? Everybody good? I'm sensing a couple questions. Okay. All right. Now, our applied moment. How do we calculate our applied moment? I just it simply support a beam, right? There we go. So I'll put a little formula right here. I'll say WL squared over 8. So the first one, we said WL squared over 8. What's L? 20. So 1 times 20 squared over 8, that's 50, right? We did this last time. I'm repeating a lot of calcs that we did before. So 1.7 times L squared over 8 is 85. So what is 1.21 times L squared over 8? Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. Okay, now once we got the applied moment, where did we use that? What did we use the applied moment for? What's that? I.E., your effective moment of inertia. Because remember, some of the beams cracked, some of it isn't. So, okay, and then that formula is MCR MA plus I know that's kind of small, but I think you all get the gist since we did that last time. What's that? Just enough. Okay, so let me ask you this. When we did that for dead load, what was our effective moment of inertia? Okay. Point 0.1 was it or point 0.0? All right, so what was it for dead plus live? Now, what changed from those two calculations? What was the different value? MA, right? Because MCR didn't change, the gross moment of inertia didn't change, the crack moment of inertia didn't change. So if it's 50, here's your value. If it's 85, here's your value. So if it's 60.5, what is it? Well, but your calculator isn't even open, though. That's the thing. But I will give you a reprieve. Somebody else.
Let me ask you this. Should it be larger than this value, smaller, what's the deal? In between. There you go. See? You said 4431.0? Four, four, Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. So we then used that value to do what? Compute deflection. Now, we have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, so the deflection is 5WL to the fourth over 384 EI. Here's your moment of inertia. Your E is the 3122 KSI. When we did that last time, we got 0 0.245 and we got 0 0.467. So what are we going to get for this one? I'll quiz you on this. Remember, units, okay? Your load needs to be divided by 12. Your span length needs to be multiplied by 12. That gets everything into inches. Anybody got an answer? Remember, your load's got to be divided by 12. Your span length's got to be multiplied by 12. 0 0.260. Really? I got 0.315. What are... Um, so the calc, the calc should be 5, uh, like that should, is, is that, has everybody got that now? That should be your calc. Okay. All right. Okay. So is everybody okay with this? Then to compute the live load deflection, we take delta D plus L minus delta D, and that got us the 0 0.222. So what is delta sustained live load? Well, it's delta D plus SL minus delta D, and that comes out to be what? Point zero seven zero inches. Does I have a second on that? Everybody's kind of quiet, so I want to make sure this makes sense. Anybody got any questions at all? Sound good? Okay. All right. So hopefully this is a little bit of an easier way to organize the calcs. But I think we needed to go through it a couple times, you know, what we did on Monday, for everybody to kind of understand that. Everybody good? It took up half a screen. <laughs> All right. Everybody good? Now, um, a couple things before we do total deflection. We need time-dependent factors. Or... Uh, I guess we'll just call this long-term multipliers. Okay. Now, um, our row prime is what again? Zero. And it is zero because there is no compression steel. Okay. All right. 
So what we're going to need is two multipliers, one for dead load and one for live load. Now the dead load is simple, okay? We adjust that for an infinite duration because dead load doesn't go anywhere, all right? Now the infinite duration multiplier is two divided by one plus 50 rho prime, which is what? Do we need a calculator for that? Two. Now, we also need a multiplier for the duration of live load. Now, how long is the live load sustained? Three years, okay? Now, if the live load is sustained for three years, what is our time dependent factor? What's our time dependent factor? How many, how many years, how many months are in three years? 36. 36. If I'm at 36, about 1.8, something about like that, right? Does everybody see that? 1.77. I'm going to call it with 1.8, but just to be conservative. So I'm reading about that point right there. Is that all right? Yeah, just eyeball it. And to the nearest tenth is fine. So, What's, what's this? All right, so that's going to be 1.8. All right. <coughs> Sound good? Okay. Does everybody have all this? Everybody good? All right. So total, uh, let me put this in. All right, so total deflection is going to be as follows. So the total deflection, in other words, the total deflection, I guess, after three years, I guess, or I guess if you want to look at it like that, or no, it wouldn't be after three years because you know, your, your uh, dead load is infinite, so we're just over a long term, is your immediate live load deflection plus your dead load deflection adjusted for time duration, in which case an infinite time duration, plus your sustained live load deflection adjusted for its duration, in this case three years. So I'm going to rewrite that. So. Okay. So let's just plug and chug. What was live load? It was 0.222. Okay. Plus the multiplier of 2.0 times, what was it, 0 0.245 plus 1.8 times 0 0.070 inches. So what is that? 0 0.838. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. So this is useless without some limit to go off of. Okay, so we need to determine whether or not this deflection is acceptable or not. So let's go back to the problem. Okay, problem says consider that this is a floor beam uh, attached to elements likely to be damaged by deflections. So let's see. All right. 
Let's see. So flat roofs not supporting are attached to non-structural elements. Mm. Floors not supporting. Roof or floor construction supporting to not uh, supporting or attached to non-structural elements likely to be uh, damaged. So this one, right? So the deflection to be considered, the total deflection sum of long-term and all sustained loads. So that one's this one. So that's what we just calculated. And what's our limit? L over 480. Does everybody see that? Does that I, I want to make sure everybody understands how to interpret that. Is everybody okay with this? This. It's a little simplex to the L squared. No, no, no. That's not L squared. I'm. Uh, let me see. Does, who, who has their textbook? It's a reference to the uh, to the bottom. I should have screen captured all, that on there. Let me see. here. I'll read that out. Let me see. Everybody brought their textbook to class, didn't they? We're in chapter six. Okay. So for the L over 480, so each of these are references to below the table. I'll screen capture this and send it to everybody. But um, this limit is really not intended to safeguard against ponding. That's what that means, which is why it really wasn't that important. Um, this, uh, let's see, this uh, is per basically what it's saying is this is permitted to be exceeded if measures are taken to prevent damage, which I really don't know what you could do if you had something like a plaster roof, maybe not use a plaster roof or something like that. And then um, this is just saying the limit shall not exceed the tolerance for non-structural elements. So, Honestly, I mean, I could provide them, but they're really not very useful for the purposes of what we're doing here. So. But again, it's in your book. That's a good question, though. Everybody okay with this, though? All right. Is everybody okay with the fact that this is our limit that we're checking since we're in this range, right? So we're comparing the total deflection to this. So that's why, I want everybody to pay attention to this, that's why you need to be able to compute both immediate deflection due to live load and the total deflection due to all the long-term effects. Everybody good? So we're comparing that against L over 480. So let's look at our deflection limit. So I'll say that, so, Well, it's got to be consistent. So just bear with me for a second. So uh, I'll say that delta max is L over 480, which, okay, let's do it in feet. All right, so this is, how long was the beam? 20 feet divided by 480. And what is 20 over 480? Decimals? You have a calculator. 0 .04. 0 .04, you said? It, does it go on or? So, one six. Okay. But it's this many feet, right? So, whoa, what happened there? That was not a mistake on my part. That was the computer. Okay. The goal, so to answer your question, the goal is to compare this maximum deflection against the limit. I, I, I'm not that good. So that's where we're converting it to, uh, uh, to inches. So convert that to inches and what is it? So 0.5. And think about it. 20 feet is 240 inches. 240 inches over 480, that's half an inch. So what does that mean for this beam? It failed if it exceeds the limit, right? So the answer, I guess, to this particular question is is that the deflections exceed the limits. So if you want a good or no good answer, this is no good, okay? But let me also be clear, okay? When I say no good for something like this, I'm saying that 
you put a feather on the beam and it will explode. Okay? What I'm saying is that we have violated deflection limits, so we're likely going to get like damage to the drywall or damage to the plastered ceilings or, or something like that, or maybe the drop ceiling has some sag in it or, or, or what have you, or maybe if you've got plumbing, maybe you've got plumbing issues or something. It doesn't mean the building's going to fall down, but it certainly isn't good. So let me ask you this, how should we address this? I mean, what could we do to this beam to, to make it work? But That's a great question. That's a great, that, you know, we, exactly, we could try and account for that. We could put compression steel in there. That's a very good answer. That's, that is honestly probably the first thing I would check to see how much of an added bonus we really get, okay? Now, I'll be honest, I don't think we're going to substantially get a, 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 a massive difference, but we will get a difference. But let's say that's not enough. Now what? Make the beam what? Deeper. Why deeper instead of wider? Greater effect on your moment of inertia, exactly. Your moment of inertia is BH cubed over 12. The height has that cubic effect on your moment of inertia as opposed to the width. You get much more bang for your buck making it wider or making it deeper as opposed to making it wider. And by increasing your moment of inertia, you're going to drop your deflection. So making your beam deeper would help. Um, But, true, but, but we're taking into account dead load effects over time. Like, I can account for that on day one, but over time, I don't really have much control over that. It's a good point, but not, not for total deflection. And it wouldn't matter for immediate either, because for immediate, we care, care about live, not dead. From the starting location. So even if you camber it, you still net. Yeah. This is net. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. This is net. Exactly right. What else could we do? Let's say, all right, let, let, me, let me throw another wrinkle in the mix. Let's say that you don't have any room to make the beam deeper. Now what? Make it better than simply supported. Make it better than simply supported. Uh, if we could change our boundary conditions, if we could clamp the end, if this is a beam in a moment frame, that's definitely going to inc uh, increase our stiffness, which is going to drop our deflections. That's going to help. You, let's just keep it simpler. You could, let's just keep it simpler. You could use a better concrete, okay? Because a, a concrete with a higher FC prime is going to raise your modulus of elasticity, right? And if your E value goes up, your deflections go down, right? That's, a, that's another answer, okay? What's another thing we could do? Think about floor systems. What's that? Well, making it longer would make it worse. There you go. If it's a floor system in a building, remember tributary width. If we put more beams into the system, each beam sees less load. Each beam sees less load, less deflection. Okay? Does everybody understand this? I really want you to, to think about this. You know, the, the other the other aspects of what we could do to improve the performance. I haven't yet had a problem like this in the class, I don't believe, where the beam didn't work, you know? So now we've got one that doesn't work. So I want you to think about this. Yes, sir? Well, I, I almost, let's put it like this. I've thought about assigning, uh, not, I'm not going to do it this semester, but I've thought about assigning a project where you would figure that out. He said, "What? Well, what's the?" Uh, he he's basically asking me for all the stuff we just spit out. What's the most economical answer? And it, look, it's there's no, it's not up option four. It, it it's not as simple as that. There's a lot of different parameters to consider, and the point is, you really just kind of need to do the work and figure out which which one is the most economical. It's a function of a lot of things: material availability, labor, um, the the clearance requirements on your building. You know, maybe you do have an extra couple inches that you could increase the depth of your beam. You see what I mean? This, stuff like this, there is no, it, there's no if-then statement we can program and just say go with option four or what have you. It, it's not like that. You've got to test it all out, use your judgment, and figure out the, the, the best solution. I, I'll say this. 
given clearance requirement, given, you know, give, given um, amount of room that you can put your beam in, you can stack a, as many beams as you need until it works, but that might not be the most economical. So, so my point is, I, I, I want to be clear that there is always an answer, okay? It's just whether or not it's the best answer. But that's, that's where all the, you just got to go through and test it out. What I would do is if I was trying to do a, a problem exactly, I would probably write a big Excel spreadsheet and use goal C, you know, to see if it's even feasible. You know, under certain deflect, um, you know, let's, let's put it like this. Let's say the limit was half an inch and the deflection was 0.52. I'd, at that instance, I'd probably figure out how much compression steel I need to put in and just do that, you know. But if it's 0.5 and the total deflection was two and a half inches, well, something's wrong. You know, something, I, something's wrong. So I've got to either add more beams or do it, use a different concrete or maybe I did a calculation wrong. You know, I mean, you've got to vet all of those, those, those options. Yes. A wall. What do you mean? Are you talking about a sheer wall or? Yeah, it's like a regular wall. You know there's going to be a wall. That's where I break down the concrete. Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, uh, let me say this. There is a difference between a wall that we would consider for structural capacity, like a sheer wall or the wall outside of the building, because those are really heavy. Um, but if we're talking about just like a general frame, and we're talking about that wall right there, that wall's what drywall some wiring some framing studs and that's it that gets accounted for in the 80 psf live loading this is related to occupancy okay so this isn't heavy enough you know to to really need to be considered as a single concentrated load does that make sense it's not if it was a sheer wall designed to hold the building up and it was a solid you know six inch concrete slab well that's a different story that makes sense. Um, anything else? I mean, this is good stuff. I really want this to this all to make sense. Well, I'll say that probably not because that's a good question. The question he asked was, if you increase your depth, would you need to go back and do your analysis for strength? I would just to complete your calculations, but from a necessity standpoint, probably not. And here's why. Increasing your D value is going to up your MN, your nominal moment capacity. And also, if you increase your D value, you're more than likely going to increase the strain in your lower region of steel, which all that do is either going to raise your fee value that you had before, or if it was 0.9 before, it's going to be 0.9 again. So by making your beam deeper, you're really just going to increase your moment capacity. So, no, you really don't need to go back and check strength. You probably don't need to go back and check shear capacity either. I mean, how do you calculate your shear capacity? Let's say just by the concrete. Um, a, or, uh, 2 lambda BWD square root of FC prime. So the D is just going to make your shear capacity go up as well. I mean, throwing more concrete at the problem is just going to increase the strength. So, probably not. So. Well, uh, that's a good point. Um, I guess it depends on the span length. I mean, if you've got a really, really long span, then yeah, you know. But on a normal, probably not. Yeah, probably not. I I I don't. It's not one to one. So. Anything else? This is good stuff. You all are quiet today. All right. I will have a homework for you for deflections on. Uh, uh, on Monday. However, I want to at least talk about development length, at least get the concept, the ideas plugged in your head. Which, by the way, hold on, before I 
begin development length. All right. I'm going to do the, the, uh, one more samurai sword and say exam two stops right here. Okay. So shears and deflections, that's exam two. Exam three, moving on. Okay. Development length, columns and beam columns, that's all exam three. Sound fair? Okay. All right. Um, one of the things uh, about uh, concrete design, you know, this is, I'll say, this is where if you took concrete design from a different professor, they might not cover this. Some professors cover this, some don't. I decided to because um, what the, the, I guess the, uh, the topic of discussion is do you cover this or do you cover geotech related concepts? Do you cover foundation sizing or retaining wall sizing? And I don't like to do that because we have geotechnical engineering, we have foundation design, so I don't feel the need to double up. What I'd like to do is cover some more detail related aspects of reinforced concrete that are important, stuff that you really don't think of. Okay, so I want to explain development length uh, in, a, in a very simple nutshell. Okay, so let's say that um, he and I are in a tug of war. Okay, so he's got the rope and, and, and I've got the rope. Okay, and we're going like this. But let's say during the tug of war, he's only allowed to grab that much of the rope. Just from there to there. Okay. Now who's going to win? Him or me? Now I know I'm a, a really physically intimidating guy, but but <laughs> but in all seriousness, if if by only grabbing that much of the rope, okay, he is not able to generate his full strength in the competition. You, you see what I mean? Make sense? All right. But if I were to give him a certain amount of, you know, additional amount of rope, he could get a better grip on it, and then it actually becomes a real contest. Make sense? Now, let's say we're in, in the same scenario. Instead of giving him this much rope, let's say I give him about six feet of rope. You think that's enough for him to get a good grip on it? Pull, right? Six feet, that sounds good, right? Now, what if I gave him 60 feet? Do you think that extra 54 feet would really make a difference? Once he's able to get a good grip, that's it, right? Make sense? Okay, here's my point. Now, I'm going to borrow this again. Let's envision that this is one big mass of concrete, okay? Just one big mass of concrete. And I have here a rebar, and I have it embedded in this concrete wall about that far. You think I'm strong enough to yank that out? Probably, right? Okay. Now let's say that piece of rebar is embedded five feet. You think I can get that out? Again, I know I'm a physically intimidating guy. I, I don't think I'm that good. Okay. In other words, there is a certain length that that bar needs to go into the slab in order to develop its full capacity. Okay. And we call that its development length. Now. Going back to the tug of war example, remember six foot versus 60 foot, that extra 54 feet doesn't really matter. The same thing's true of rebar, okay? Let's say that the development length for a piece of rebar is five feet. Once I get it five feet into that mass of concrete and I yank on it, I will fail the rebar before I fail the concrete, okay? That's its development length. But if I stuck it in another 54 feet, it wouldn't matter. I would still fail the rebar before I fail the concrete, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now we'll go into specifics later. I'm done with your, your scale, by the way. And, I, and I'll talk about this specific example here in a little bit. But there are um, reasons and, and um, parameters that affect a, a, a rebar's development length. First off, rebar develops strength through the ribs on it. I mean, those ribs are what grips the concrete and allows it to transfer load, right? So there's a couple instances that are going to affect uh, the development length of a piece of rebar. And, I, and I'm not going to get into the math today because uh, we've only got a few minutes and I'll, I'll just call it. But I want to show you something. Um, for instance, how many of you all have seen this type of rebar? How many of you all have seen that? This is epoxy coated rebar. Okay. Now, which do you think in this scenario has a longer development length? This or the epoxy? The epoxy. Why? It's slippery, right? 
you, it doesn't bond as well, so you need a larger development length. Make sense? Okay. So, like, for instance, here's the equation for development length. I know it seems really nasty, but it really is just plug and chug. Okay. What you'll find is, for instance, uh, this is our epoxy coating factor, this uh, size of E. If you just have uncoated bars, then your factor is 1. But if you have epoxy coated bars, you either have a 1.2 or a 1.5. So you take that development length and you increase it because you've got to embed that rebar more into the section in order to develop its capacity because, like you said, it's slippery, right? Make sense? Now, some, in some instances, you're going to find that development lengths are pretty long, so that's where we hook rebars, right? By hooking a bar, that bar has a heck of a lot uh, uh, more grip than a straight bar, right? So, you know, we're, we're going to account for that. Does that make sense? Some professors don't cover this, some do. I think this is important, so that's just me. All right? That's all I got. I, I'm going to call it for today. I will see you all on Monday. I will have a homework for you on deflections on Monday. All right? Sound good? Yep. All right. Yes.